Hi, good evening. Thank you for joining us. If you're um, tuning in uh, through our YouTube channel, thank you uh, for, for tuning in. I'm Michael Young. I teach in the School of Critical Studies. And um, I want to first off thank uh, Rosa and Moham, the visiting artist coordinator and visiting artist coordinator assistant. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to um, do this, this lecture series uh, without their help. Um, so this is the final installment of the Fall 2021 Aesthetics and Politics Lecture Series, uh, which has been focused on the theme of documents and cultural memory. I'm really excited to introduce John Michael Rivera, who is visiting us from UC Boulder. Rivera's talk, Alluding All Documentation, um, it, um, excuse me, um, Rivera's talk, Alluding All Documentation, um, concludes the semester long lecture series on the topic of documents and culture. I said that, um, my, my memory is, um, is, is not, not functioning. As epistemic objects, documents are unambiguously ambiguous. They offer us, as through a glass darkly, the promise of knowledge about the past. At the same time, they threaten to file us away into categories of socio-political repression in what the late photographer and theorist Alan Sekula, a longtime faculty member at CalArts, calls, quote unquote, the shadow archive. According to Sekula's classic essay, The Body and the Archive, quote, the general, all-inclusive archive necessarily contains both the traces of the visible bodies of heroes, leaders, moral exemplars, celebrities, and those of the poor, the diseased, the insane, the criminal, the non-white, the female, and all other embodiments of the unworthy, end quote. John Michael Rivera's recent book on documents powerfully responds to the shadow archive with both conceptual clarity and stylistic creativity. It is a book that is hard to categorize, categorize, and that is precisely one of its virtues. According to Rivera, quote, undocuments is concerned with the complicated and contradictory ways in which peoples of greater Mexico have been documented and undocumented within necropolitical systems of colonial knowledge and rendered as specters of the state, end quote. This sounds intriguing to you, Gloria Muck, because we have John Michael in the flesh to tell us more. Please help me welcome John Michael Rivera. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you, Kalars, for being here. I, I, it's, it's been a wonderful experience to talk with your students from the Aesthetics and Politics program, but also just to walk around and feel this energy, which has been uh, like no other place I've been, and I, and I really, really need that, which makes a very nervous and anxiety-ridden um, experience, which is meeting in front of people and in front of virtual people, um, much more pleasant and, and, and invigorating. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read from uh, Undocuments and uh, to explore uh, some of the uh, ways that I curated it here, a little bit different on how I imagined the book in, in particular areas. And then I want to read from um, a, a new book that I'm working called Recoil, uh, which is um, engaged with um, gun culture and specifically uh, the El Paso shootings that occurred and it's not necessarily on the El Paso shootings this particular section but it's kind of the I guess you could say the, the preface if you will to, to engaging with what recoil is and to start that conversation with you all is is wonderful this is the first time I've, I've had a read besides giving it to colleagues and friends so it's really nice to be able to share it too. How do you document the undocumented. An encyclopedia ought to make good the failure to execute this inquiry. Dennis Diderot. 
52 keys form the alphabet beneath my fingers. Sequential punches illuminate the words hidden within the frame. An unnatural union of brain and inanimate touch marks this delicate relationship between my hand and the lettered gray keys. Perfectly squared black pixels frame the outline of knowledge. Information flows from the mind to plastic to sand to flesh to paper to another body to another eye that gazes upon the page in a world made new every entry. The touch of knowledge feels cold, feels dead. The ghost in the machine speaks. How do you document the undocumented? This inquiry, manically repeated, over and over belies the effectual relations that inscribe a ghostly demarcation, undocumented. A word that simultaneously documents, inscribes, and erases, it creates a condition somewhere between the living and the dead. A spectral speech act that reveals the anxious feeling of being Latinx since the 16th century. To document the undocumented, to undocument the documented, haunts Latinx existence, this inquiry bespeaks a special Latinx subject rendered by the shadow of the state and collected by a parchment doppelganger that leaves us split between paper and flesh. This action, this in-between being and non-being, this is the same state of the subject, a mechanism. The logic of our modern information culture, of our, my, anxious age of documentality. The irony is, the, there is an irony buried here within this period of hyper-visibility, now when everything is being cataloged and systematized and more documents are being created than in any other period of history, we are left with an anxious, anxious feeling of being perpetually revenant. Documented subjects of the nation state feel and are rendered like ghosts, an absent presence within their own home, a living dead subject haunting a nation state where documents turn paper to flesh, flesh to paper. And yet, to ask the question, how do you document the undocumented, undocument the documented, is both emancipating and impressive. It leaves the subject searching for a mooring that will tether their bodies to a state whose documents write and erase them. Phantasmal logic of necropolitics. We are all recreated and in and out of existence, moment to moment, year to year. Decade to decade, century to century, with the stroke of a pen and the touch of a keyboard. I document while internalizing paralyzing thoughts of my inevitable death. This feeling, this condition in this phantasmal body, my body, it invokes an anxious feeling of writing under the weight of erasure. What Heidegger described as su rachur, I'm sorry, ikritore uh, su rachur. And this state of being informs the necessity me, of creating undocuments, modeled in part as a thematic encyclopedia. From Pliny's seminal encyclopedic model to Diderot's affective catalog of the enti entirety of Enlightenment thought, to Sahagun's colonial new world, to Hegel's systemization of absolute idealism, to Wikipedia's democratic, all encompassing internet project to document the past and future knowledges of the world. Encyclopedias write out of an anxious imperative to document in the face of our future finitude. As related to Diderot's primary discourse, an encyclopedia is the an act of humanistic self-preservation in the wake of the inevitable decomposition of bodies. An encyclopedia then desires to contain the sands of entropy, to snatch death of oblivion as the road would state, and inscribe a world slipping away from us to fight human infinitude. Encyclopedias are like the last gasp of air we take in our deathbed, moments before the certificate of death is inscribed and cataloged, a life remembered and forgotten with the stroke of that pen and cataloged on the shelf alphabetically. Excuse me, shelf alphabetically. The Florentine Codex, which is the main inspiration and model of the documents, is a haunted text. The first book to organize and document ancient Mexican culture. This book, Sahagun's Tomb, tome, was composed in the wake of the Spanish colonialism and mass death, and has devoted countless entries to describing death and its rituals. It is important to remember that Sahagun and the Nahuatl compilers wrote frantically while hundreds and thousands of Mexicans were dying from the ravages of colonialism. 
The work fought not only the erasure of Aztec knowledge, but also the death of the extermination of the entire culture. Born out of mass death, the Florentine Codex is the first work to reflect the necropoetics of documentality that continues to affect Latinx culture today. This document to catalog my ancestors haunts my project. It serves as a reminder that colonialism and the Enlightenment organized peoples not only to preserve and archive their existence, but also to bind them within as documents, as paper ghosts in the ancient and long ago world. I searched for ghosts in the pages of the Florentine Codex and the documents that followed and return to the archives over and over, enacting an inversion, inverse version of redaction theologia, one that is not searching for the voice of the historical Jesus, but rather recovers the subaltern dead the voices erased within the parchment. Erasure then is recovery, for it is in erasure that you find the voices of the dead in official, in official documents, buried deep in the parchment and ink. In this way, I follow the groundbreaking work of Mexican artist Teresa Margolis, whose work uses documents to mediate the relationship between the living and the dead, asking us, quote, to see what is in the shadows, and inquiring, there must be answers in the shadows. When did it start, and we didn't notice? Embracing shadows as in their documents is an affectual act of necropoetics, and this recovery leads me to the same how do you document the document? This in turn gives way to the creation of a dying printed form, a dead document in the age of pixelated wonder, the encyclopedia, a wailing disembodied collection of metamimic injuries that partially resurrect the traces that lie buried beneath the archives of the state. Documents, undocumented specters that emerge when the eye's mind focuses on the refractions of the obliterated that surround us daily. Undocumented looks at what I call the necropoetics of greater Mexico, undocumentality then, with an eye toward what Chicano theorist and poetic, uh, poet Gloria Anzaldúa imagined as la facultad, which is a poetic and affective capacity to see the deep structures below the surface. This enables the materialization of the spectral within documents that at face value give life through state authority and decree it opens my pineal eye, my third eye, as the time would argue. It enables me to see the phantasmological that is not rendered in the first place. Finding reason within the spectral logic of the document is made possible through Anzal Dua's concepts, and similarly with the Thai argued in the dossier of the pineal eye, which I read as a metaphysical way of seeing the dead. The Thai argued that such a vision is possible through secretion of the pineal body a way of seeing the spectral, absent presences within the material document, within the ink of the Enlightenment. Let us not forget that for Anzaldúa, Matai, and later Derrida, the specter is both material and immaterial, living and dead, resurrected through the register of decay. What Anzaldúa shows us in the time explains, enabling to see, to see our Nietzsche's fan, quote, phantasms lead to phantasms, documents with documents. Documents with documents. I am haunted with visions of leaked, dead documents. Paper is paradoxical. It not only inscribes existence, gives life, but also simultaneously renders the body as a trace object of the information age. It is, in effect, a dead document. While we live in a world that catalogs their document and creates wiki pages, for every moment, we also live in a world where real flesh and I'm sorry, where real flesh and blood people are made and unmade as inanimate, lifeless documents. Documented is that action, the complicated and contradictory ways in which Latinx people are made into living dead subjects who are simultaneously erased in the very paper that forms to their existence. This is the colonial power of paper in the information age, of the circulating document. For buried within its rhetoric, rendered in its representational powers within the ink, within the very pulp of the document itself. Every document has the desire to constitute its object as a living ghost, a specter. Documents then resurrect the social imaginary, as Ferraris would have us believe, but they do so by rendering the subject partial and fleeting, the living dead, to borrow 
in Mendez's work on the necropolitical. They are in an in-between state, fighting to resolve who in Pinoli, the Thai, and the playful hand of Derrida exceeds ontological opposition between absence and presence, visible and invisible, living and the dead. It is no surprise then to learn that greater Mexican people have been in the public sphere has been labeled as the quote, invisible ghostly minority. How do you document the undocumented? 54 times Trump's 2017 Raise Act legislates his answer through the word strike. Striking so emphatically in order to erase the laws of the past with the stroke of a pen, the Raise Act attempts to strike millions of immigrants from our landscape who now are barred or deported after finding that they do not qualify for entry. I take the Raise Act, I fail. I scored 26, the minimum score is 30. I would not be allowed to enter the United States if I were trying to enter today in 2017. I can't forget that I have the privilege of taking this test as a documented hyphenated subject, a Mexican American, yet many of my Hinta and extended family do not have this opportunity. They are forced after the removal of DACA or being stricken by the Rays Act and other historical documents to hide in the shadows of the information age when documents, so sorry, when documents they were told would free them from obscurity, from invisibility, failed to inscribe them. The question then, how do you document the undocumented, for me is deeply personal, is deeply contradictory. It's is deeply hypocritical. For me, it emerges out of time, circumstances, geography, fate, and the colonialism and neocolonialism that made it possible for me to write a book as a documented Mexican of the United States. Born in 1969 to Mexican parents, both spent time in the fields of Edgardo, Texas. I was documented by birth certificate as Caucasian, a circumstance of documentary racial history. It is important to point out that at that time, Mexicans were not documented race in Texas, despite having been murdered and racialized since annexation in 1936. When I was born, segregation and the racialization, excuse me, racialization of Mexicans, both documented and undocumented, were harsh realities in Pasadena, a city, a city built on refineries outside of Houston, Texas. The Bracero program, which made it possible for some of my family to come to the United States, had just ended, and Operation Wetback was also in its last iterations. There were swimming pools that I still could not swim in, and barbers where I could not get my hair cut, and the, re re no, sorry, the, res with the residual Jim Crow laws were still clinging to a more subtle information networks. Today, I'm awarded a passport with a pamphlet that directs me, quote, the world is yours. I can travel from state to state and country to country because of my circumstances of documenting happen. Because of luck. As much as I am part of a large Latinx community, I am very aware that, I, that we are categorized differently because of documents, given inscription or erased because of paper that governments legislate. Writing 47 years after our certified living now in this documentary wiki, wiki age, when Trump and his administration saturate the public spheres with propaganda about immigrants in order to subjugate and control knowledge about, quote, Mexican rapists, murderers, animals, and those, quote, in the unhuman. I begin this prelude and the final edits of this book's entry on the days Trump signs an executive order to deport millions of Latinx immigrants and when nearly a million DACA recipients are now put in legal jeopardy, a six month state of limbo where, while awaiting this new legislation. Now that next are relegated to an information age purgatory before they are located and deported using the very documents that promised to give them presence and security. So I cannot forget that I begin the pages of this book during yet another period of crisis for immigrants in the United States. Sadly, one of many I will recover as the book goes through. In the book, there are 12 um, erasures that begin the preludes for each, each of the book. And those uh, preludes, uh, erasures, come from actual um, statements from Sahagun that are in the actual encyclopedia. This, these particular preludes, which are separate from the actual encyclopedia, are um, the only time that he actually uses the word 
I or actually speaks as as a, a con contributor in the encyclopedia. The other word, the other word, the encyclopedia as encyclopedia goes through, there's no I, which is kind of a very informal, I'm sorry, much more formal document. This is from Book Two Ceremonies. All writers authenticate. I know they made truth in these books. It was done this way. Grammarians employed in ancient times conferred many days. They, I, explained language, and I, writing the explanation, painting lost originals. I still have the originals. Exile from Texas to California, 1973. From a distance, El Campo, Texas looks as if the earth had finally swallowed it up. Seventy miles from civilization, a coastal town suffocates under the poisonous slopes of yellow tinged hyacinths and tallow trees. The backdrop reveals smoke billowing from the nearby bay, rising, rising until the coastal breeze pushes it, pushes it into the lungs of Palacios. From there, ice and cotton fields march with bodies to the edge of the parking lot. Manicured earth give way, gives way to dilapidated American beach and dance halls called La Mandalovia, or Mexican Saturdays. We stood alone as many on the far side of town in an undocumented sanctuary unsanctioned by the church. Smoke covers the setting sun's partial light just long enough to see the faded facade that once welcomed hundreds of documented and undocumented light. Now layers of dust and dirt slowly eat away the siding once smooth and red as the surrounding earth. Upon this pot blood-stained skin, graffiti conjoins with and mocks a mural of two dancing ghosts held in suspended relief, deserted now by those who slowly tear down its stucco skeleton. With every passing day, they learn to forget their past. No documents remain. What is left is a cracked marquee, now only partially visible, specters left behind in their memory. Lying toward back, excuse me, lying back toward the sky. Windshield framing, rot, gray, heaven, earth, too fast to see it clear. Four years old, small enough to fit on the Malibu dashboard, a journey carried by a car colored by a dusted sage steering wheel, westward through the desert, searching. It looks like he tastes the muddy color on his lips, muted brown swirls on his puckered tongue already starting to desensitize to Mexican flavors. His green eyes blind to their touch, overwhelmed by the vivid surroundings for 1,000 miles, terra incognita. Was this the moment he learned about panic? They wind their black asphalt, excuse me, they wind through black asphalt roads now, flecked by the dust of other travelers, their voyage to the other side, now fixating on the outline of his mother's head, looks like the broken dust has gathered in crevasses around their bodies. Small mountains outline them. He embraces it. He touches the fine red brown powder, white crystals speckled with age like rock salt, the flavor of the mountains of earth of tomorrow. Encyclopedia. Encyclopedias and the documents contained within them fight the finitude of our anxious death drive, but in doing so, they do not resurrect the person as whole, but rather as partial and fleeting, a documented ghost resurrected through ash to pulp. It is not surprising that our culture of hyper-documentality and creative destruction, the modern print encyclopedia and those who sold it cannot escape death. Let us not forget that the encyclopedia salesman died in 2007. Throughout the internet, a satire about Scott Willie Loman, a product play off the Arthur, Arthur Miller's Willie Loman, traveled like a virus, eulogizing the fact that he had taken his last steps of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Wikipedia's wireless routers had finally solved one of the hardest mathematical conundrums, the traveling salesman problem, one of the most studied problems in computational, computational mathematics. With the solution of the paradox by mathematicians, the last salesman died. There was no perfect, profitable route a salesman could take to dis disseminate knowledge. Indeed, 
the best, most direct, shortest route was found in cyberspace with its simulated space and digital knowledge. Wikipedia published a solution and algorithm created by an invisible hand. The ghost of the machine emerges as the last homo documentator. Willie's death, excuse me, Willie's death uh, died despite, sorry, Willie's death occurred despite the fact that both the World Book Encyclopedia and Encyclopedia Britannica, the two largest employers of encyclopedia salesmen, neither denied or confirmed having given up their traveling sales divisions. For a decade, the encyclopedia salesman was the main force through which portable knowledge circulated in the United States. With book in hand, he traveled, mostly he traveled, in areas up to 2,000 square miles, selling information to a mostly white emerging middle class. Ironically, the birth of the encyclopedia salesman is not documented, though his mercantile ancestors had their origins in the 1840s when the American Industrial Revolution arose. The salesman was the hand that reached out to rural America, the first domestic exporter importer. By the 1930s, conservative estimates put the number of traveling sales encyclopedia at 300,000, though some say the numbers were near a million. But the encyclopedia salesman was bred onto himself, was agreed onto himself. He, the salesman, was almost always white and male. And he did not peddle cosmetics, vacuum, snake oil, or other goods of capitalist desire that would help divine the character of white middle class, which wanted middle class. The encyclopedia salesman sold the promise of white uplift through portable knowledge. Britannica's mission to have a set of encyclopedias in every home in the United States and eventually the world. By the early 1980s, 40% of American households found a spot in their homes for hundreds of pounds of books. And still, there is no entry in the online encyclopedia or Wikipedia or World Book that covers the history of the encyclopedia salesman. What will be known? Perhaps an, epi an epitaph noting that this is the moment, the point about which some historian from some future date will write, here lies Billy Bowman, died on a human day in June 2007. Without documents, I cannot recall his name. So I don't remember exactly what he looked like, but I remember him like this. He wore a suit in August. I do not know, excuse me, I do not know that he was one of the, I'm sorry, I do not know that he was the only salesman in one of the, in one of the only Mexican populated areas in, in, in Los Angeles County, the San Fernando Valley, North Hollywood. This was his area. I do know that he was a Mexican. I do know. I do not know if he was the only Mexican encyclopedia in the world, but I do know he was the only one I knew. His car was clean, brown, and toned. Though his car was well kept, he did not drive it house to house, an act that would be strange in LA. No, our salesman parked his Pinto nearly one mile away. Every morning he would depart from his car and walk around with every step perfectly planned. Like all good salesmen of his time, the night before he entered a new neighborhood, he mapped out the exact route, marking meticulously the shortest and most direct path. When first seen him from a distance, you would think he was lost or confused, or perhaps you might think he was a neighbor who was searching for a long lost memory or a home he had once called home. I'm sorry, once called part of his youth. He would not go door to door, rather he zigzagged through the streets, sometimes only visiting one house per block. As an only child and latchkey kid, I spent hours watching him from our upstairs apartment. Every morning, he would grab four volumes of the World Book Encyclopedia, perhaps A, E, M, N, and O, my favorite letter, and follow his route, a journey he had now planned out for nearly 10 years. He came to our green stucco house when I was 10, our fifth rental in as many years. It, looked, it stood separate from a small apartment complex of people I had never knew. When the salesman knocked, I knew he was who he was. I had seen him for over a week, weeping his way through the neighborhood, waving to every person who approached and drove by. He passed our house four times before he knocked. Each of those times, I was alone. The day he finally approached, my mother was home. He knocked. She answered the door as if she had planned this day. Her steps brisk and assured that was visit. She let him in, he did not begin did not begin selling this encyclopedia. Rather, he asked me if I liked school. He 
You attend Toluca Lake Elementary School, don't you? His voice free of any hint of Spanish, as monotone as the brown suit he wore. Yes, I said, but, but, my mother interrupted. He skipped a grade, you know. He looked at her. He, f he had found his way in, the focus of the sales pitch in, in sight, me. He continued to ask me questions about my school, what I liked about it, and the subject I found interesting. With each answer, he would refer to his books, highlight my knowledge with his meticulously documented encyclopedia. They were beautiful, faux brown leather and gold leaf edges, thick paper that slid like plastic silk over my forefinger. A library of English fingertips, he repeated his slogan over and over. My mother bought the full set with the supplemental volumes, which he assured us would come forward. 200 pounds and a footprint of five feet took up valuable real estate in our 800 square foot apartment. This was the largest purchase my mother had ever made. We paid in, we paid in monthly installments. It took two years to pay them off. By then, however, I had lost interest. Despite the supplemental volumes, the organized knowledge in my encyclopedia slowly escaped the bindings. Despite their physical enormity, they simply could not keep up with the pace of new knowledge. Every moment, a new anecdote. Every day, a new fact. Every year, a revision of history would tarnish the gold leaf of the pages. I think somewhere around here, I still have the dictionary. The rest of the volumes are lost. Fleeting ghosts of my memory, I still can't recall his name. Walls. This is more towards the end of the book. I built, I built walls with the absent words of my father. The first bricks were laid when he emotionally left my mother and me when I was three. My mother and I would flee to the patriarchal walls of Texas to never truly return again. In the decades that followed, we peeked at each other from either side of a self-imposed barrier, never really knowing how to cross. Yearly visits became weekly calls while hearing my mother fighting with him over the years about child support, then the physical absences turned into monthly calls. My father and I would talk today, monthly usually, but to the mundane, and but about the mundane, and about my daughter, whom he has not seen in over 15 years. The last part of the wall are the last parts of the wall are solidified when I see him fall down the stairs having a heart attack when he is 53. Landing on a cold white tile, his face empty, his color sucked out of him. Staring over his body, I don't think that I don't think to do CPR. I slap him in the face to wake him up, thinking he passed out from exhaustion or low blood sugar. My first panic attack happens that night. Watching him roll down the stairs in the field all unresponsive, dead. And realize that the end or death was neither elegant nor romantic. It was physical, visceral, confused, and loud. Death would haunt me for decades after this moment. He would haunt me. He died for a few minutes. He would tell me during the recovery weeks that followed. I saw you over me, he would say. I told you. I told him I did not want to talk about it. I couldn't tell him I, I think about his death every day about my death. We talk about everything but ourselves. The last section of the wall is complete. Son, you say you want to put up a fence in your backyard, but you don't support a border wall. This is hypocritical. What do you have the right to secure your possessions while governments has no right to put up its own fences? President Trump is trying to save us all. Dad, I'm not going to go into the major ways. Your anecdote is false, but I do want to say that, that you do remember that our families are immigrants, right? And that all of them had cross walls to get there. All of us at one time or another were undocumented. You said you did ancestry DNA, right? You called me four times about the results. There are no such Houston peoples we are descendants of. Son, no one hopped over a fence. We came over here the right way. You know, Obama has a big wall around his, his house, right? I bet the taxpayers are paying for that one. Ha, ha, ha. 
that our families pick cotton and cultivated rice in Texas fields. They are not citizens. How do you forget these things? Did you know that Obama had more threats on his life than the other presidents combined? That I'm not going to ask everyone who visits for their papers or shoot them or separate their families or ask my Italian neighbors to build my wall. I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying, I'm sorry, I am just trying to make sure Winnie does not get out and leave her fence out for the day. The dog runs over and runs out whenever she gets a chance. Son, that is crazy. Slow down, slow down. We need a wall. It's getting crazy here in Houston. Gangs everywhere. Drugs in all the schools. You remember poor Joshua Wilkinson, boy down in Maryland? He was murdered by a DACA. You don't know what it's like here in Texas. Dad, where does your wall end? He is quiet. And the conversation in which we debate politics, irrational politics, concluding in the same way three or four different times over the months, is over seven minutes. It's rapid fire back and forth. Nearly all the calls are seven minutes long. How did the Mexican man become so afraid of himself, of his people? Maybe fear is inherited. Maybe this is why I fear my own death, why I get uncomfortable PVCs, fear of returning to Texas or seeing him. Every year I tell my daughter we are going to visit. I'm going to take, I'm going to take her to see him before he dies. You're getting old, son. The whole family is getting old. We will all be gone soon. He told me a few months, he told me a few months back. I tell him I will be there, just not this year. There are just too many walls on the way back to Texas. Postlude, an inquiry on the edge of tomorrow. Will I be granted an afterlife? I asked this question while sitting in the archives of the Richard Library, the library Michelangelo designed, and where, like me, George Bataille would read the Florentine Horettes. My second time here, I'm finally allowed to see the last book, The Conquest, and think about the end days of my ancestors. Were they given an afterlife? Will I see the people that I've been studying for so long in this afterlife? Sadabun prayed to God that his codex would grant him a privilege of an afterlife, after documenting that Mexica people whom his own culture would help destroy. My mind traces the path of the Florentine codex took to Italy, to Mexico, and I'm taking from this monument of the Enlightenment to the Mesoamerican ruins of the goddess each hell in Mexico on the Isla Mujeres. By a thousand-year-old stone structure crumbling 13 miles from the resorts that littered the coast of Yucatan Peninsula, I show my passport to a government official before I have to enter the ruin and I'm given a wristband that must be worn at all times under the risk of prosecution or deportation. The wristband's number corresponds with the number of my last four digits of my passport document to ensure that I do not loop the ruins. Like many before me, however, I enter the ruins only to take off the document from my wrist and tie it on the altar, a sacrifice for my eternity. Meditating at the edge of Mexico's haunted Mesoamerican past while peering at the fathomless gulf, I am undocumented for one fleeting moment. I close my eyes and imagine myself walking off the page. So what I'd like to do is, if I can, I think I have a little bit of time left here, is read you um, some parts from Recoil. Recoil, in many ways, um, begins or un undocuments, ends, and it turns from the material document and paper to the gun. And uh, a lot of this, me thinking about guns, began um, with the El Paso shooting, but then again, um, during the, uh, the pandemic, and uh, a new neighbor then moved in, uh, a Latino uh, business person, who happened to be a, a member of a Latino gun club. And I started, uh, I was very interested in this because this guy's the most Obama, Democratic, and Green's artist, Latino gun club. And I started uh, finding across the country that a lot of um, African American, Latino, 
their gun clubs were, were, were emerging everywhere. And this, this gun club actually was just was downtown and lower downtown, and which is a, a lofted area that's been very gentrified over all the years. And um, so I, I I started thinking about the relationship that Latinos had to guns. And and so I started kind of uh, thinking about not necessarily the gun itself, but I was interested in the recoil of a gun. It, the, 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 and, and I mean that in a very metaphoric sense, in the sense that the, the, the gun creates such a, a, a vibrancy to it, right? In, in kind of new materialist sense, but, but it also is kind of is what I found is this idea of the gun's recoil and the way it destroys, but also how, how the term recoil comes up in, in so many literary illusions. I started kind of playing with this as my way to kind of engage what gun culture meant. And so um, this is uh, mortal recoil. The living leaves recoil before our fires, Kathleen Rafe. Like an overcharged gun, I recoil to data about Latinx. Guns have killed 77,000 between 1999 and 2021. And they are twice as likely to die from gunfire than non-white Hispanics. I read the report and speak the number in silence, 77,000. Twice as likely to die. 77,000 data reverberating in my body like stone through the Gulf of Mexico. The ripples echo long enough to make, to make me bookmark the report. And later, when it hits the networks, I change the channel when it becomes an anecdote headline that will infect Americans' understanding of Latinos as a violent people. Must be cartel violence. Trump's got to build that wall, America tells themselves as they conceal and carry their racism on their lips. 77,000, 77,000. I have grown tired from the recoil of guns. I am numb from the human tragedy created from 77,000 projectiles piercing bodies, its reactive resonance destroying the eardrums of the world. This is our condition. This mortal recoil rips through Latinx communities. It dismembers, mushrooms, damages, murders, mutates, devoices, voices, embodies, disembodies, heals, tears flesh from bone, unites and tears family from family, turns people into strangers, destroys communities, screams, whispers, cries, turns friends to enemies, tears state from nation, country from union, creates and destroys borders, facilitates genocide, creates genocide, ends genocide, fractures neighbors, freezes and speeds time, imbues entropy, begins and ends civilization, and begins and ends world wars. At the same time it has become the force of humanity, recoil numbs America's mind. My mind dulls its senses and creates a permanent anathema on every inch of our body politic. We have lost touch with the force of pain, the sound of death, now hidden in the black box is explained in pure map and algorithms presented to us in perfectly insulated graphs. 77,000, 77,000. The data fails to define the true nature of recoil. We are left with the memorialization of the gun, and we celebrate its recoil in schools between mass shootings and poetry lessons about the America Revolution, marked by the shot that was heard Around the, side, around the other side of the world, as Ralph Waldo Emerson put, who reminds us, created the United States of America. We all ignore the recoil that ended America's history. The stone often recoils on the head of the thrower, Queen Elizabeth I. In the laws of physics, Newton's third law of motion teaches us that each action, within each action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. When a bullet is fired from a gun, it experiences a force in forward direction, action, and instantaneously the gun exerts a backward force or reaction. The law is written F underscore AB equals negative F BA. But this now definitive formula of the known universe, this basic symmetry of nature, would first find its root in the language of poetry. It was 80 years before when Shakespeare would capture the mortal force of recoil in unrhymed iambic pentameter. In numerous plays, recoil and its materialist incarnation, the gun, emerges twin leap motifs that are intertwined with the force of language and mortality. 
We begin to see this in the world of words of Queen Margaret in Henry VI. Quote, these dread curses like the sum against glass or like an overcharged gun recoil and turn the force of them upon thyself. For Queen Margaret, her consistent dread curses in the play are like shots at the royals and the voice of her language mimics the recoil of the gun whose reaction calls into question the patriarchal institution of the monarchy and their actions. When she returns as a specter in Richard III, she continues to be a cursing force that enables Shakespeare to show us that the logic of language is similar to the natural laws of recoil. Recoil, if you follow this curse of smoke within Shakespeare's plays, is the mortal coil of our existence. For it is in Hamlet where Shakespeare presents recoil as an absolute sign and signifier of mortality. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, we see this in the question to be or not to be. Let us not forget that central to the soliloquy is a line we have shuffled off this mortal coil. And as his fate reveals itself, we begin to see that he is toiling with the existence that runs according to Newton's third law. Hamlet, we learn as the play unfolds, and he is recruited as a, sorry, and as a, he is recruited as a weapon by his spectral father to, quote, mark me, mark me, is the ghost prosthetic gun for the father to enact his revenge. Hamlet later responds to the ghost by pointing to the burden of being the weapon and holding, quote, all pressures past, unquote. All pressures past. This poetic alliteration sounds out the force of time as we to this, Hamlet-like recoil becomes not only a gun, but a temporal interface between the living and the dead. But more in Hamlet, we see recoil as the element that binds the past, the present, and the future. In this, Hamlet, Hamlet's famous to be or not to be, where this mortal coil culminates, is Shakespeare's first law. And the question of mortality, existence, revenge, loss, life, and death, temporality, and language, is formed from the smoke of this reactive force. The reflective movement, movement is being taken as an absolute recoil upon itself. Hegel, science of logic. There is an omnipotence of recoil. Emerson, eight. Years later, Hegel and Ralph Waldo and Walter Emerson would extend Newton's laws in Shakespeare's mortal coil by positioning by positing recoil as, uh, quote, absolute, end quote, and omnipotent, end quote, as a dialectical and metaphysical force that sees conscious embodiment emerging from being and nothingness and from fate and free will. Recoil emerges from their hands as an absolute originary force of world making and world ending. Recoil is the moment of imminent dynamism, dynamism of both our ontological and epistemological imaginations. Emerson, in particular, like the poet Shakespeare, we look to recoil as a poetic force of human nature and extend it to the U.S.'s history of nation building in the, in the poem The Conquered Him, where the it, quote, shots heard around the world commemorate the revolutionary emergence of America. Ironically, though, this sonic emergence perforates eardrums and mutilates bodies at the same time that it built the shining city on the hill. Recoil is the absolute dynamism of America's rise as a nation. But as Emerson prophetically hints, recoil continues to reverberate in the soul of America, where, as the poem marks, quote, the conqueror silent sleeps, end quote. He asks us then, what happens when the shot of a gun is a constituting force of the nation's rise? Living in the borderlands means you fight hard to the pull of the gun barrel, Orion Zaldua. Hundreds of years before the shot at Concord would give birth to the American nation, the Concord of the Americas would feel the recoil of guns tearing their, their civilizations apart. Writing in the early modern era of Shakespeare, Sahagun's The Florentine Codex would be the first document to mark the moments when Spanish guns and their recoil would destroy the indigenous civilizations of the Americas. In the last book, The Conquest, where my book and documents ends, Sahagun recounts that the recoil of the Harket Musis, quote, exploded, sputtered, discharged, thundered, and disgorged. Smoke spread, it grew dark with smoke, every place filled with smoke. The fetid smell made people dizzy and faint, 
end quote. He continues, quote, they especially made them faint when they heard the guns went, went off and the Spaniard at the Spaniard's command, sounding like thunder, causing people actually to swoon, blocking their ears. And when it went off, something like a ball came out from inside. The fire went showering and spitting out. And the smoke that came from it had a very foul stench, striking one in the face. And if, they, and if they shot at the hill, it seemed to crumble and come apart. And it turned a tree to dust. It seemed to make it vanish, as though as someone had conjured it away. This conjuring recoil of the Harkabas and Harkubuses would haunt the indigenous of Latinx and the Americas and continues to reveal itself in the lives behind the data of the 77,000 dead. The fetid smoke created 400 years before by by the, by the guns, continues to engulf Latinx living in the borderlands formed, not on maps, but from reverberations of a colonizer's gun that helped destroy the Americas and break it into carceral borders now patrolled by men who carry over the 96 Ds. Today, Anza Dua reminds us that for those in the borderlands, recoil is the logic that gives birth to the colonized consciousness. For to live in the fronteras is to be in the crosshairs of the gun and of the gun barrel that began to recoil when the Spaniards fired at their guns hundreds of years before. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge. Like that. My recoil began in my memories in the summer of 1987, emanating from aircraft sonic booms and shotgun muzzles that mutilated four desert cats. Two twin brothers choreographed this mass killing for their names did not escape me, but I bury them. And I will tell you that the youngest twin had a limp and slouched from an accident that, he, that was strangely unspoken in the town where everyone knew every detail of their past. Their father was the sheriff of a small desert town, mostly keeping secrets of the military and aerospace industries that fed its inhabitants with the government's, like dollar bill, I'm sorry, with government dollars of Reagan would funnel to our tables. We grew up between the Lockheed military factories and Edwards Air Force Base, where together they tested mass, we mass weapons of destruction daily. Boom, boom, boom. Every day our heads we heard the sonic booms of military planes. As bombs exploded on dry lake beds, we became desensitized while we learned how to read, write, and do arithmetic. The twins had a ranch in Lake Los Angeles, roughly 23 miles from where I grew up in Lancaster, California. Their audience today were all children of, of Reagan's Cold War, our parents who worked on the elusive Skunk Works project, a stealth plane that could elude radar and drop laser targets, target bombs that would nearly, sorry, and would nearly be home by the time the recoil was felt by the mutilated bodies caused by 100 munitions. This violence, this recoil on the other side of the world penetrated us slowly, unknowingly marking our relationship to objects of war objects of pain. The brothers created their own fear and war for the local boys. I watched as they herded cats with tuna, herded cats with tuna cans. One, two, three, four, five cats strung on a tree with wire. The cats crying, screaming, violently shifting and contorting, trying to escape. One is able to free their leg, falls to the ground and limps off. The brother with, the, with, with his own leg points the gun at the fleeing cat and stops short of shooting. We don't need that one, he says. The others are more quiet, tired and exhausted from the trauma of being hung. I'm about 10 feet behind the audience, quiet. We are all so quiet, waiting for the performance to begin. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this, one of the boy asks. The older twin says his dad wants them to kill the feral cats who have taken over the property and pays them for each cat. They are wild with disease and kill the chickens. At the time this relieved me, the detective said we should do this. The law wants us to kill cats and free our sick of disease. I begin to walk closer to the audience, and at the first step, the first shot goes off, and the first cat is hit, his body torn into two parts, bloody cords onto the desert earth, flesh scattered yards away. The cat did not turn to dust, did not vanish as though someone had conjured it away. Its mutilated body barely hanging looms louder than the shot. The other three cats begin to wail again, and the brothers ask if any of us wants to take a shot. 
two volunteers, my best friend and I respond, we are good, we are good, in a phase that both condoned and questioned this act that we were witnessing. The older twin looked at me as if he knew, if he knew my motivations. Rivera is scared of guns. His mama didn't teach him how to shoot. It did, pointing out that I was the only one raised by a single mother. Fuck you, shoot your daddy's gun and get this over with so you can go to Nautilus with that fucking cat money. I'm fucking hungry, I yell back. It's my gun, he explains. Just load the gun, I tell him. He hands the gun to his younger brother to reload. Boom, 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 boom. The multiple muzzle blasts create shockwaves in front and behind and engulf us. The force from the pellets disintegrates the leaning cats behind the smoke of the recoil. After the last scream, everyone stares and remains hanging on the wires. The crows and Gagopis will pick up the parts. We can just leave them there. But I have to gather the paws to show Dad will be killed, the older brother tells us. As he ends the play, we walk back to the car to get food, not in silence, but chatter about the power of the gun. None of the dead cats or the mass killing we partook in or the mutilations and death we had created. We acted as if nothing had taken place and nothing mattered. That gun is insane. You felt it everywhere. I told you it was cool, huh? It's not even heavy. We were under the spell of the recoil, captivated by the technology and vibrancy of the force of the shotgun. The cats, our final baptism. We were no longer children of Raven's Cold War, but young men complicit in our cultures, in our culture of mass violence. We were, after all, born under the shadow of war, war planes and raised by silent booms that perforate our childhood. This mortal recoil framed our manliness, our humanity, long before our shots would mutilate four defenseless desert cats. I did not ask it then, but I question now. Am I the recoil of a gun? Thank you. Is there any questions or you want to chat about anything like that? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for listening and, and uh, I appreciate listening to the tip of tip and new, new stuff as well. It's hard to read and remember. Yes, maybe I can start. First, thank you so much for sharing this. I mean, um, your work has this uh, such deep searching quality and it builds a lot of tension and, and, and everything just seems to have such such deep resonance. I mean, anyway. Um, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Uh, really, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first, maybe more of a, a remark that feeds into the question. Um, Hearing the, the new, new work, I, I couldn't help but think of this thesis that one of our students wrote last year that was on read performance. So it's very much like taking a performance and then doing it again, maybe in a different context in another way. And Ali um, eventually came up with an idea of what's the re and it's a colon. And so when you're writing, uh, uh, saying recoil, I couldn't help in my mind just be like re colon coil in some moments. And, because it, it, it builds a sort of temporal dimension to it that seems so essential to everything that you were expressing. And, and, and it reminded me, uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, of like Christina Sharp writing about in the wake. The wake, yeah. Yeah, and where it's an event that's still unfolding, even though people want to sort of uh, put away or it's gone or, 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 or erase or not admit. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how you're seeing time working in, in the, the story that you're telling, if you could maybe build into that. Yeah, that's that. Thank you. That's lovely. I I I'd love to, to hear more about this this project. That sounds fascinating. And you know, part part of the, the performance I was kind of playing is you know, obviously I was Shakespeare and the play of Shakespeare, so I was kind of you know, playing this other this other play, if you will. The, the idea of, of of the temporal. Um, and if we kind of go back go back to to Hamlet, where, where Hamlet it becomes this kind of this, this temporality that's kind of playing itself out, but also within a lot of uh, Temporal theorists are kind of looking at uh, Newton's third law and second law as well as looking at how 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 is recoil temporal with, with, with time. The one thing that this um, uh, the, the piece is going to do, I'll, I'll be honest with you, that this recoil is is uh, it, 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 the, the undocumented. I, I talked about undocuments in the sense of um, understanding my position as a documented Mexican American and having the privilege of, of, of that. There's something really much more um, 
problematic with flirting with gun culture that I see them to be doing in, in this particular project. And, and when I when I when I started looking back in my my life, there was all these moments of trauma around guns. But at the time, um, if, you know, historically marking if you can temporally historically mark moments of your memoir through moments of of moments of gun recoil, right? And that's kind of what I've been kind of you know, exploring. And, and the more I look, like, there's another scene in here. I remember if I go back um, to the younger, the no, the older brother's uh, wedding wedding, and and um, and they we were there was a, a bachelor party and we were heading down. In like a little like a bus thing, you know. I think I was in grad school my first year there, and um, everyone was kind of laughing and, and, and you know, you know, hadn't seen in a long time and so forth. And he says, "Hey, you know, don't get too wild tonight, but in case you do, don't worry." And he lifts up his 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 pant leg, and he has a gun. Wow. And and I was just kind of, I, I was taken aback, you know, and, and what's, but, but, you know, to your typical point, though, but, but the thing is, though, there's something about that gun moment, that moment of seeing the gun and, and the moment of the cat, of these kind of performative moments that are around the gun that are so present. I, I, I don't know what it is and, uh, about being a, around a gun. And, and I go back to this, you know, I've been doing a lot of the Ed Paso shooting, um, Investigation, and you know, I, I should know that I was at, on the Boulder campus when, when the, the mass shooting occurred a, a mile away from the campus just last year at the King Supers, and um, it, it happened, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic area. And um, you know, it, 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 you hear this a lot, you know, I, I time froze. Right, you know, the people were in the mass shooting time froze, and, and everyone, you know, how, how guns and recoil of guns have an ability to change temporality in a way that I think no other device does in, in American culture. Because, it, but you know, and, and that's kind of like, you know, and then Emerson, you know, literally stating, you know, in his, you know, conquered him that, um, that the oh, recoil can also create an historical moment and create a nation. <clears throat> Right. So, yeah, I think that, you know, thinking through the temporality and history of recoil is definitely kind of something I'm going to kind of start playing with, but also like how um, guns and uh, I'm not sure if you've ever shot a gun. I went shooting with this, with this person and um, it's, it's like nothing I've, I've ever experienced in my, my entire life. I both hate it and love it. Same time, and I'll be, I'll be, you know, quite honest with you. And I know this that, that offends people. You know, it offends my wife dramatically. And I remember, you know, uh, going shooting, and um, and she was raised in a military family, and and, and and she was just like, "What the hell are you doing?" She goes, "This immersive pre nonfiction shit is taking us too far. <laughs> this is just ridiculous." You have to, and I was just like. Well, I can't really write about guns if I don't know about the allure of why is it that there's more guns in this culture and what is it about humans fascination with guns? Right? And 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 yet everyone knows that they murder and destroy 77,000 lives, and yet my neighbor is, has 19 guns. My father has a lot. Right? And I mean these are, you know, and and it's just it, it, it's fascinating to me, and that's, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of come, come to terms with that. But thank you for your question, because I think I don't think I was being as uh, intent on the, the temporal aspect of it, but I think it's something I really want to kind of explore. Because I literally I'm kind of thinking now as, as, as I'm here. Thank you. Any other? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I was, I was so compelled and so drawn to um, print documents upon reading it. And, um, I was really interested in this idea of digital archivalship. You mentioned it very briefly with um, Wikipedia as an example. And um, I was wondering if you could um, you know, explain briefly just um, what digital archivalship's role is in um, undocumenting or in documenting the unknown. I'll give you a story to answer that question if I, if 
better for me. Um, it's no, no theory, just, just give me a story. So when I um, uh, left, uh, I, I just graduated from Berkeley, and um, I had an opportunity to um, go to Houston and do some work and rebrand classes, but also uh, work for what is called the Recovery in the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Project. And this project, the, the goal of this project was basically to find all archival documents written by Latinos, and even um, about Latinos, from the colonial period to 1960, right? And um, when I started, there were some um, 1,200 documents. It was very, very early on. And my job when I got there was to become the chief digital curator for newspapers. And what we did, and what we were doing with everything, was taking material documents. And literally, some documents were like blankets and phones, and, um, to newspapers, to books, and like all kinds of different broadsides, and to digitize them. And back then, um, it seems like back then, this would have been in 94, 95, 96. Um, OCR software, uh, optical recognition software, you know, digitizing these particular documents, was the ultimate goal, right? And what I found so interesting is, you know, the, the desire of this particular um, uh, project was to recover through documents the lost heritage of Latinos, because the argument was that we, if you can find the documents of the past, the literary documents of the past, then you, you inevitably become, it's a, it's a nationalist project. But the ultimate goal was to digitize and to make public in a widespread way, right? And, and to, to digitize these, these documents was, was uh, a, a, a feat that cost, you know, an at t was giving us money to do this. It was very, very expensive. But I remember, like, you know, sometimes scanning them and kind of going through them and descending. There, there was something incredibly lost when this digitization was occurring. And that's when I started understanding the power of, 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 of archives that are material versus digital. And this is a long way to say to you, there is a difference between digital documents and material documents. And, 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 and you know, ironically, you know, everyone, you know, every time we would have a, a meeting, we'd go to archives, sometimes families, their families, but archives they had in boxes, and so forth. It was just incredible, like, romantic. To the, to the document, this, you know, this archive fever that Derrida refers to is actually quite liberating, right? It creates this you know, kind of wonderful um, euphoria. And uh, but but when you you know you're you're looking at your computer screen and you're you're seeing this document, you, I, you, you see it in this incredible distancing way that uh, that, that that is you know, quite 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 different. And this was the same too. You know, that I. Uh, I had learned about the Florentine Codex and studied the Florentine Codex for years in, in digital form, and then it was a, 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 like a translation. I find, you know, they, they don't, I, they don't let you see this 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 document. You, you have to you have to apply to see the document, and then you literally have to prove why the digital version will not suffice for you actually being there and touching it and being in this Michelangelo's in the library. And it took me three tries to explain to them why I needed to touch it. Because I couldn't really explain well, you know, what, why is it that I need to be in there? And I went back to the, you know, I finally just you know, I wrote something creative for them. And I said what it means to be in a space and experience the space and the effectual relationship you have to the materiality and the vibrancy of things and to touch it. And, and to be there, to be present. And uh, they got the end. <laughs> Which, I couldn't believe, I was like, I have nothing to lose. And so I literally like, wrote the, like, this prose poem, you know, and, and uh, much shorter. I didn't even answer the questions I had answered. And, and, and next thing I was there, and I was able to go there two more times. Which, which, was, which was, you know, quite wonderful. And in fact, I'm going to go there again because there's the, the stuff that's on guns, and there's also um, the, uh, the uh, there's a, a memory, uh, 
there's a, like a, like a first draft of the Florentine Codex uh, that's a lot smaller um, that uh, that is there, and, and that has much more of the conquest gun stuff. <laughs> And so I'm kind of looking at these kind of synchronic moments. I'm looking at the, the beginning of the introduction of recoiling guns, um, and then I'm, uh, which occurs around you know the making of the Americas, if you will. And then I'm looking at the U.S.-Mexico War, which becomes a time when the, the proliferation of patents for gun culture shifts from military to actually private use around the U.S.-Mexico War around that time, and a uh, handgun is really. Right, and then of course the West right comes out of that, and then we go to um, El Paso, and then it, 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 the mass shooting in El Paso, and those three kind of historical moments um, weave in with me in the relationship to guns, and um, well, I, 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 we have all kinds of places to make question. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, no. That definitely touches on everything that I've been considering with the idea of uh, digital archivalism. And there, there's, um, I think that there's, you know, been some really good work, um, specifically with the um, new media archaeologists, uh, Wolfgang, um, Iser, and those, those folks who are doing some really interesting work with um, that question of the digital archive uh, and, and, and the relationship to, to, to technologies and, and the shifting understanding of what archives mean. Because there is something really interesting. Just to kind of come to your point is, is you know, I think we need to. I don't think I've been talking about enough. I think where you're alluding to is what is um, what happens when techne or, or technologies of archives change in the very same archive? Do they become something else? Right. Well, let's uh, give John Michael uh, another round of applause.